Bismillah, Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah, ala alihi wa salihi wa salam, inna alhamdulillahi nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'afiruhu, wa na'udhu billahi min shururi anfusina wa siyyati a'malina, man yahdihi allahu falamudilla lah, wa man yudlil falahadiya lah, wa ashadu an la ilaha illa Allah, wahdahu la sharika lah, wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa salam, inshaAllah. So after taking... Uh, we're just one week break, alhamdulillah, we come back and inshallah continuing with the shama'ir of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam at the end, as requested last time we met, inshallah, the monthly competition is going to be inshallah tonight at the end, bi idnillah. So, three questions and I'll explain it when we come to it, bi idnillah ta'ala. So, the last thing we talked about was the cup of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the qadah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. That's the last thing we mentioned. Now we move into the fruits, or the fruit that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam used to eat, or things related to it. So the first hadith here, it says, "Kan Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam yaqul al bil rutab." He used to eat qitha, and qitha you can translate it as cucumber. Although it's from the family of the cucumber, but it's bigger and longer than that. But you can translate it as cucumber. He used to eat cucumber with fresh dates. Join them together and eat them together. That his habit وسلم, was to eat those together. And in the following hadith, he used to eat watermelon with fresh dates. al بالرطب. And in a following hadith, Al khirbiza bilrutab. Al khirbiz is um, a watermelon, but it's yellowish. It's a yellow, yellow watermelon. I don't know if it's honeydew or something different than that, but at least it's a fruit similar to the watermelon. So it tells you here that the Prophet ﷺ would join these two together when he eats them. Why? In another hadith, he explains. Next, we mediate or moderate the coolness of this with the heat of that, and the heat of that with the coolness of this. That is, food has qualities. So when you eat, let's say watermelon, what does that give you? It cools you down. Right? It has a lot of um, water to it, and also brings down that temperature. Same thing if you eat cucumber, or anything from a family of cucumber, the same. Dates, on the other hand, produce heat in the body. So the Prophet ﷺ here say, moderate this with that. So, so hey, this is what he used to like وسلم, and you can actually try it. So instead of eating one alone, you can eat together. And subhanAllah, I mean, food has qualities in it. Even if we forgot in this modern age that it has qualities, food has qualities and it can sometimes affect your mood. We know that. Chemically, it can affect your mood. And can enhance your, your recovery or can it make you sicker, depending on what you're eating. So here, if this is something that is too intense on one side or the other, if you want to moderate it, you join those two things, the opposite, together, and they, in a sense, equalize each other. And you know that sometimes the food also, subhanAllah, when you join them with, some, with another type of food, it enhances their benefit. And if you eat it on its own, it's good. If you eat it with something else, it enhances its benefit. So this could be also the case with these two things, that when you eat them together, their benefits could be enhanced. It tells us, the following hadith tells us um, something that the people used to do when they see the first fruit, right? the first, the new fruit coming in, the beginning of the season. What would they do with it? They would bring it to the Prophet ﷺ. And the Prophet would have the following, would make the following dua. So the first thing, in the beginning of spring, let's say, and they see the first fruit, the first dates or the first grapes, they bring that to the Prophet ﷺ. And the Prophet would say the following, Allahumma barik lana fi thimarina. Ya Allah, bless our fruits for us. Wa barik lana fi madinatina. And bless our Medina for us. Wa barik lana fi sa'ina wa muddina. And bless our sa' and mud for us. And these are units of uh, size. Sa' and mud are units of size, not weight, but size. Then he says, Allahumma inna Ibrahim abduka wa khaliluka wa nabiyuk. Ya Allah, indeed Ibrahim is your slave 
and your loved one, especially loved one, and your prophet. وَأَنَا عَبْدُكَ وَنَبِيُّكَ And I am your slave and your prophet. وَإِنَّهُ دَعَاكَ لِمَكَّةَ And he had made a dua for Mecca. Ibrahim made a dua, supplicated Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and made dua for Mecca. وَإِنِّي أَدْعُوكَ لِلْمَدِينَ بِمِثْلِ مَا دَعَاكَ بِهِ لِمَكَّةَ وَمِثْلُهُ مَعَهُ And I'm making dua for Medina. Like what Ibrahim made dua for Mecca and like it with it. So Ibrahim made dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would bless Mecca. And would grant it fruits and food even though Mecca is what? Does not produce much. Mecca does not produce much. But he made dua, but he said, بِوَادٍ غَيْرِ ذِي زَرْ In a valley that is not cultivated, has no plants in it. So it does not produce. Yet he made dua for Mecca, Allah blessed Mecca. So the Prophet ﷺ here is saying, Ya Allah, as Ibrahim had made dua for Mecca and you accepted from him, Ya Allah, I'm also making the same dua for Medina and also equivalent to that, meaning make double. What is in Medina, make it double. What is in Mecca? ضِعْفَ مَا بِي مَكَّةَ مِنَ الْبَرَكَةِ Double the barakah that you will find in Mecca. Then he said, ثُمَّ يَدْعُوا أَصْغَرَ وَلِيدٍ يَرَاهِ Then he will call the youngest lad, the youngest boy or child he will see, and he'll give him this new food. So this is a dua that he used to uh, say, and it tells you that you're always connected, subhanAllah, to Allah Azza wa Jal. So when you see something new, what, what comes naturally is to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for it. And to ask for barakah in it, and barakah in Medina, and bar- barakah in your city, and barakah in the entire thing that Allah Azza wa Jal had given you. And he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam doesn't eat it, but what he does with it, he gives it to the youngest child he sees. They say that there is, so, um, it's suitable that he gives it to the youngest child, because this is the youngest fruit, or the freshest fruit, and he is the freshest or the youngest human around. So there is some... Uh, you know, suitability between, uh, between him and that. Now, so uh, there are a couple of uh, weak hadiths here, so we move on to the Sifatu Sharabi Rasulillah. The description of the Sharab, the drink of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It says, كان أحب الشراب إلى رسول الله الحلو البارد. The drink that he loved the most, what was it like? It was hulu, sweet, and barid, cool. A cool, sweet drink is what the Prophet ﷺ loved to drink. Cool and sweet. So now naturally, because where they lived is a hot climate. So this is naturally something that he would like, would be natural and uh, good for the body, but also sweet. And what do we mean here by sweet? Either they mean by it, fresh water, or also sweetened water. And how do you sweeten water, by the way? Dates, so we talked about that, right? So you put the dates in the water, you leave it overnight, that would sweeten the water. Or you can mix what with it? Honey. honey. You can mix honey with it. So that would sweeten the water. So the Prophet ﷺ loved sweet drink that is also cool. And the following one tells you of um, one of the manners of drinking. And it's an incident that happened with the Prophet ﷺ, Ibn Abbas and Khalid Ibn Walid, radiyallahu anhu. So Ibn Abbas is narrating this. He says, I came upon Maymuna, the wife of the Prophet ﷺ. We came with the Prophet and I have Khalid and Walid with me. So three. The Prophet ﷺ, Ibn Abbas, who is the cousin of the Prophet and from the family of the Prophet, and Khalid ibn Walid. So Maymuna brought a bowl of, or a cup of milk. So the Prophet ﷺ drank, and to his right was Ibn Abbas, and to his left was Khalid. So he said to Ibn Abbas, after he drank, and there's something left in it. So all of them are going to drink from the same bowl. So he drank from it. And then he turns to Ibn Abbas and he says, أَشْشَرْبَةُ لَكْ فَإِنْ شِئْتَ أَثَرْتَ بِهَا خَالِدًا He says, it's your turn to drink. أَشْشَرْبَةُ The drinking now is yours. That bowl and cup is yours. To, it is yours. فَإِنْ شِئْتَ But if you wish, you can grant your turn to Khalid. Because he's sitting on that where? Left. So that tells you that one of the manners is that once a person finishes drinking and he wants to pass this on, you pass it to where? The right. That's the natural order of it. But he, sallallahu alayhi wa wanted to honor Khalid with it if there's a possibility. But he did not command it. 
did not command, do it. He did not command it. He basically said, it's your turn, but if you wish, you can give it to Khalid. Khalid accepted Islam later, and Khalid is older than Ibn Abbas. So if you wish, you can honor him with it. What does Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu says? مَا كُنْتُ لِأُوثِرَ عَلَى سُؤْرِكَ أَحَدًا He says, I would not favor anyone with what is left over from your drinking. I would not give it to anybody. That is, if you drank something and what's left has touched your mouth, touched your um, tongue, so that's what's left. So I'm not going to give that to anybody else, that's mine. Okay? So this tells you about the love that they had for the Prophet wasallam and the barakah that they sought from what he drank, what he ate. When anything that touched him wasallam, we'll see other examples from it, inshallah. So then the Prophet and then it continues... And then he says, Man Allahu ta'ama, the Prophet says, if Allah feeds you something, then you should say, Allahumma barik lana fihi wa at'imna khayran min. Ya Allah, Allahumma barik lana fihi, Ya Allah, bless it for us, wa at'imna khayran min, and feed us something better than it. Right? Ya Allah, bless it for us, that is, if Allah Azza wa Jal feeds you anything. So part of the du'a, you encountered before a du'a of the Prophet ﷺ, right? When you finish eating. That's also another du'a. Allahumma barik lana fi. Ya Allah, bless it for us. And feed us something that is better than it. وَمَنْ سَقَاهُ اللَّهُ عَزَّ وَجَلَّ لَبَنَا But if Allah gives you, feeds you milk, what should you say? Allahumma barik lana fi wazidna min. O Allah, bless it for us and give us more of it. Because he said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that nothing stands for food and drink as milk does. So he, part of the sunnah of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is, Allahumma, when you eat something, whatever it is, Allahumma, barik lana fi. So again, asking for barakah. Barakah in what you ate. And if Allah gives you barakah in what you ate, what do you get from it? What do you get from it? Hmm? Good health. And it doesn't hurt you. And you stay full. Right? So there's complete benefit and there's no harm from it, alhamdulillah. And you stay full longer. Barik lana fi. Wa at'imna khayraman. Give us something even better. So you're always looking forward to the rahmah and the mercy and the barakah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Except he said that when it comes to milk, milk does the job of two things. Food and drink. If you're hungry and you drink milk, you're full. Especially if it is full milk. You'll be full. And also if you're thirsty, it will quench your thirst. So there's nothing better. In a sense, there's nothing better than milk. And that tells you about the virtue of milk. Fadlul laban. The virtue of milk is there is nothing better than it. So there's something that if you want to, in subhanAllah, enhance your health or the health of your children, introduce or keep milk into their diet. Now, the description of how the Prophet ﷺ used to drink, or the sifa, the description of it. Naam? The dua for uh, the milk. Allahumma, what is it? Allahumma barik lana fi wa zidna minhu. Allahumma barik lana fi wa zidna minhu. And Allah bless it for us, wa zidna minhu. This is what you say if you drink milk, inshallah. So the description of the drinking of the Prophet wasallam, And here, the question that we'll uh, try to answer, one question, is that can you drink while you're standing? Can you drink while you're standing? So we'll answer, inshallah, this question by the time we come to the end of it. It's a, not a one chapter. So one hadith here is someone saying, a sahabi is saying, رَأَيْتُ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ يَشْرَبُ قَائِمًا وَقَاعِدًا I saw the Prophet wasallam. Drinking while standing and sitting. And I saw him drinking when he was sitting down and when he was standing. Both. I saw him doing both. Second hadith, Ibn Abbas says, I gave the Prophet ﷺ to drink from Zamzam. Saqaytu Rasulullah min Zamzam. Fashariba wa huwa qa'im. And he drank from it while he was standing. So I gave him to drink from Zamzam and he drank when he was, while he was what? Standing, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. A third hadith. Here is a Ali ibn Abi Talib doing something that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did. 
He says, Utiya Ali bikuzin min ma'in wa huwa fi rahba. Ali ibn Abi Talib was brought water, a container of water, and while he was in a rahba. A rahba, they say, either that is the yard of the mosque, or that is a city in Iraq. This or that, possibility. This or that. But either way, was brought water. فَأَخَذَ مِنْهُ كَفَّ So he took some water from it, and he cleaned, uh, washed his hands, rinsed his mouth, rinsed his nose, and then he washed his face and forearms, and his oh, and wiped over his face, forearms, and um, his head, and then he drank from it while he was standing, still standing. And he says, هَذَا وُضُوءُ مَنْ لَمْ يُحْدِثُ This is the wudu of the one who did not break his wudu. One who did not, who is not committed, uh, or he is not impure. <coughs> so, and he says, هَكَذَا رَأَيْتُ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ فَعَلْ This is what I saw the Prophet ﷺ do. Meaning, was this a complete wudu? No. no. So he's saying that when you don't need to make wudu, because there is no ihdath, you did not commit any act that will break your wudu, in a sense you're freshening up. A sense you're freshening up. You're just cleaning your hands, your face, so wudu here they say, this is the linguistic meaning of wudu, which is cleansing. Because wudu has a linguistic meaning and has a religious meaning. The linguistic meaning of wudu is general cleansing. Any cleansing is wudu. Nadafa, at tanzif The religious, specifically, religious meaning of wudu is what? The shari meaning. Meaning with the one that you do for salah. So he's saying, هذا wudu man lam yuhdith, meaning this is if you do not need to make wudu, but you just need to freshen up, especially if after you've eaten or this or that, this is what you can do. And he says, this is what I saw the Prophet ﷺ doing. It's not a full wudu, but he touches upon some of the limbs and some of the areas of wudu. And he drank while he was also standing. And he says, I saw the Prophet ﷺ do that. Inshallah. So we will take a little detour from the same so leave uh, drinking while standing and see another manner, then come back to, uh, to the issue of drinking. If you can drink while you're standing or sitting, we'll come back to it. We'll take a little bit detour and see how when you're drinking, how did the Prophet ﷺ drink? Did he drink it all in one gulp or did he break it down? So he says, كان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يتنفس في الإناء ثلاثا إذا شرب ويقول هو أمرأ وأروى he used to, he says, I'll translate this literally, inshallah, then explain it. He used to breathe, right, in the cup, and it means mean in the cup, but while drinking, he would used to breathe three times, and then he would say, huwa amra'u, it is easier to take in and digest, wa arwa, and more quenching of thirst. What does it mean? That if he had a cup of water, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he wouldn't just put it on his mouth and drink all of it at once. But yet anafas will breathe three times. That is, he'll drink, stop, move the cup away, breathe, bring it back, take another sip or few sips, move it away, breathe, and take the final sips and then move it away. So it's not all at once, but in stages. In stages. And that's his sunnah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. كَانَ يَتَنَفَّسُ فِي الْإِنَاءِ ثَلَاثًا So, there's a prohibition of blowing into the water. Or breathing into the water. But here what is meant by that hadith is that when he breathes into the water, if you read it in Arabic literally, you think oh, he's breathing in the water. No. It means that he's drinking and giving himself rest and then drinks more and so on and so on. And why does he just, why does he do that? How did he justify it? He gave two reasons. One, it's more likely to quench your thirst. And the second, it's easier on you, on your body. Rather than take it all at once, no, in stages, inshallah. The following hadith, it says that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, he's saying, he's describing, he said, he came to my home. فَشَرِبَ مِنْ قِرْبَةٍ مُعَلَّقَةٍ There was a water skin, a container that was made from skin that they used to keep water in. So it was hanging. So the Prophet ﷺ came and he drank from it while he was standing. فَقُمْتُ إِلَى فِيهَا فَقَطَعْتُ Then I went, I went to the mouth of that water skin and I cut it after the Prophet ﷺ drank from it. Why do you think he cut it? Abu Barakah. To keep it. 
to keep that part for himself because it touched the mouth of the Prophet wasallam. So he says, okay, touched his mouth. So he went and he cut that part so that he can keep it for barakah uh, of the, from the Prophet wasallam. And that's almost the same hadith happened with a woman sahabiya. A Prophet came to her home. There's a qirba, there's a, a water a skin also hanging. Drank from it while he was standing. She did the same thing. Went to it afterwards and she cut that part so it would keep the... Uh, part of it that touched the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and the last hadith here is that it's uh, Sahabi is saying that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam used to drink while he was standing. So now let's try to answer the question because that's the conclusion of this uh, chapter. Let's try to ans- answer the question: Can you drink while you're standing, or do you have to sit? Now we saw from these hadith a description. That the Prophet ﷺ, from his act, he drank while he was standing. There are some other hadith that tells us that the common practice of the Prophet ﷺ is to drink while he was sitting. And in fact, he commanded that and prohibited us from drinking while we are standing. So the ulama, of course, they take different views on how to reconcile all of these hadith. So what we say, bi'ithnillah, is that the preferable thing, the common practice that you should have is what? Sit. When you're drinking, sit down. That is better for your body and that is really following the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. But in circumstances where it is difficult for you to sit down, you can drink while you're standing and you have here the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ to support you. So for instance, they say in Zamzam, when he was given to drink from Zamzam and he drank while he was standing, they say it's crowded. It's typically crowded that it's difficult for you to sit down to drink. Or that water skin that was hanging from the home, he could not take it down to drink from it. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So maybe like, for instance, you're you're, uh, thirsty and there's a water cooler. You cannot sit down to drink from it. You either stand or you don't drink. So you're allowed to drink from it, inshallah. So when there is a need and you cannot sit down, it's permissible for you to drink while you're standing. But if you can sit down, it's always best. And that is the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ and his consistent practice. Inshallah. Now we're going to now, inshallah, move to the next chapter. And we're going to be talking about the perfume of the Prophet ﷺ. Ta'atturi Rasulillah. How he used to perfume himself or that, what he used for that. And by the way, this is something that the Prophet ﷺ loved. He said in one hadith, one of the things that I love from the dunya is perfume. From your dunya, one of the things that I love is perfume. And you will see here in the first hadith, it says, كَانَ لِرَسُولِ اللَّهِ سُكَّ يَتَطَيَّبُ مِنْهَا He had a container, a perfume container that he used to take uh, perfume on to put on himself, sallallahu alayhi wa So he had a specific container, container for perfume. Meaning that this is something that was his habit, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We shall say, this is something that he loved. And it was his habit. He had something special to put perfume in. And he loved to smell nice smells. And he loved that people would smell that from him too. So that's sunnah. That is sunnah. Inshallah. For you to seek beautiful uh, smells. To put them on your body. Inshallah. With the condition that if you are a female. You wouldn't do that when you're leaving the home. Inside the home. Inshallah. It's fine. But don't you do it when you're leaving the house. So we'll see more of it, inshallah. So the Prophet ﷺ had special perfume and a container that he would put it on. And Anas ibn Malik, the Sahabi, كان لا يرد الطيب. He would not reject anyone if he gifts him perfume. And he said, the Prophet ﷺ never refused a gift of perfume. Never refused a gift of perfume. In fact, he said, there are three things that should never be rejected. If somebody gives you that as a gift or offers it to you, three things never reject. al wasaid pillows, and al duhn perfume, and al leban milk. If someone gives it to you, you don't reject them. So leban, or you can when you, when you consider all of those three. These are things that are easy to carry, easy to accept. Right? And usually, inshallah, there is no hardship in accepting them or trying to reciprocate that gift. 
So they're not going to put any burden on you. Plus, their benefit is big. So we talked about milk and its benefit. And perfume, the Prophet ﷺ loved it so much that he would never reject such a gift. And he's telling you, don't reject such a gift. If somebody gives it to you, never reject it. And pillows, because they're very easy and beneficial, especially for them. They didn't have the carpets or the furniture that we have. So if somebody gives it to you, if you're visiting, or actually gives it to you as a gift, it's a very easy but very useful gift that you can use. So he says, these things, do not reject them. And he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, طيب الرجل رجالي ما ظهر ريحه وخفي لونه وطيب النساء ما ظهر لونه وخفي ريحه he says, the perfume of men is what is smell, or is uh, smell is visible, discernible, he can be found, but it's colorless. So it, you can find its scent, but it doesn't have any color. That's the perfume of men. The perfume of women is the one that has color, but is scentless. Okay. So what is, what, what is he talking about here, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? So he's saying that, especially if you go out, the perfume of men is one that has a scent. That's why you put on perfume, right? Has a scent. But it has no color. Who should put on perfume that has color? Females. Because it's beautification. So he says, there is some perfume that if you put it on, has some color to it as well. He says, that you leave to the woman. Because you don't, you're not going to decorate yourself with color. For men, you're not going to decorate yourself with color. So you want something that is colorless, but has a scent. As for the sisters, when you leave, this is when they leave the home, they can't leave anything with a scent on. They cannot put any perfume with a scent on. It's haram. And actually, in fact, if the sister has anything with a scent on, with a beautiful scent, she's commanded to stay where? Home. So if there's incense, there's bukhur that she has put in the home, and her or her clothes smell of incense and bukhur, she cannot leave with those clothes. It's not, she's not allowed to leave with those clothes. She cannot have any perfume on. So what kind of perfume can she put on when she leaves? One that does not have any scent, but can have color. But if it has color, what does she need to do? Cover it. So if she puts it on her hair, or her face, on her hand, and it has color, and it is decorative, you cover it. So that it does not attract attention. So you're not attracting attention through the smell, and also you're not attracting attention through the color. If she's home, she can put whatever perfume she wants. If she's home, whatever perfume she wants. But if she leaves, it cannot have any scent. If it has any scent, she has to stay home. And something, inshallah, that we can add, I know that the Prophet ﷺ hated that anybody would find any foul or a disagreeable smell from him. Any bad smell. He hated that, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So that is also part of the sunnah. So I know that, mashallah, we cook a lot of delicious food at home. And all that smell comes and inhabits our clothes. So imagine you, sallallahu and you may like this smell. But some people are sensitive to it. And you bring it to the masjid, some people can't really tolerate it. So why not follow the sunnah of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, change those clothes and bring out something that doesn't have any smell on it, or spray it with Febreze, let's say, scentless Febreze, that takes away all that smell. So that when you're coming to the house of Allah Azza wa Jal, your smell is neutral, if you're uh, a sister, or neutral because it has all that smell has been eliminated, and then you add on some perfume. So that people, when they come to the masjid, they're comfortable psychologically, emotionally, they smell that, and they're happy to be in the house of Allah Azza wa Jal. It affects them. So whenever you are going to engage, inshallah, or be in a place, uh, in congregation, coming to the masjid for salah, especially for Jum'ah, but also they say when you are about to read the Qur'an, receive guests, guests, put on some perfume. So you should have, inshallah, a couple of bottles, a corner there where you have all of those perfumes, especially if you can, inshallah, and it's affordable, and in that must miss it. Okay? Buy that, purchase it, all with the intention that I'm going to put it on to follow the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. Something that is light can be carried with you everywhere and you put it on, it changes your mood and the mood of everybody around you. SubhanAllah. How many times, SubhanAllah, you smell something like oud and whatever and it just brings you back to an experience of a masjid or experience of Mecca or an experience of Medina just because of that. 
and your entire mood changes. And the opposite is true. So this is a sunnah, a dear sunnah, valuable sunnah from the Prophet wasallam, and also eliminating bad, foul smell from your home, for the sake of your husband, for the sake of your spouse, for the sake of your children, for the sake of your neighbor, and also when you come to the masjid for the sake of your neighbor, standing next to you, he also and she also deserves that from you. Not to know exactly what food you were just cooking and you finished eating. No. And we move on, inshallah, to the next chapter. And it's about the speech of the Prophet ﷺ. How did he talk? So Aisha radiallahu anha said, ما كان رسول الله يسرد كسردكم هذا ولكنه كان يتكلم بكلاب بين فصل يحفظه من جلس إليه. She said, رضي الله عنها, the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم would not talk as fast or as much as you guys are doing. She's noting something. I'm going to tell you what it is. There's, there's a background. He is not does not talk as fast or as much as you guys now are doing. ولكنه كان يتكلم but when he used to talk his talk was بيّن فصل clear and he'd take time with it the words are separated from each other and they don't merge because you're talking so quickly the words just melt right merge into each other right so he says he's not talking like that بيّن it's clear and فصل there is you know, a separation between the words يحفظه من جلس إليه the one who's sitting listening to him would memorize what he's saying and if few words, few words, and they are clear, clear pronunciation, clear explanation, as if you were sitting and listening to him, and you then if he ends his speech, you would have memorized or be able to recollect what he was saying, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Why is she saying this? Because the incident was that she was in her home, and she was praying, radiallahu anha. Then Abu Hurairah came, this is after the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa death. Abu Hurairah came, sat close to her house, and he started narrating and reporting the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. He was doing it, according to her, too much and too quickly. A lot of hadith, and one after the other. And she couldn't catch him uh, before finishing her salah. So she finished her salah, by the time she finished her salah, he was gone. That's her comment. He was saying that, the Prophet ﷺ did not speak as much as you guys are doing, and he not, did not speak as quickly and as fast as you guys are doing. But rather when he gave a hadith, he'd take his time with it. So that if a person is listening to it, he's able to memorize it. Now what is the excuse of Abu Huraira? Abu Huraira memorizes how many a hadith? A lot of a hadith. And he's a teacher. And so maybe someone comes and asks him about wudu. What a hadith about wudu do you have? So he gives them one hadith after the other, one hadith after the other. So he's telling them that your method is not like the method of the Prophet ﷺ. Uh, Abu Huraira has, has his excuse. He just wants to empty and give what he has to as many people who could listen. But he's saying that that is a different method than the method of the Prophet ﷺ. And it tells you about the optimum way of teaching. That if you want to teach, you don't need to cram so much in so little time. Rather, you can spread it out and make sure that the that listener understands what you really want from them to understand. That's the best method of teaching. And that they're able to recollect whatever you have said to them. You don't want them to forget it. If they forgot, if they forgot it, it's as if you didn't say it. But if they're able to remember it, then you have done your job, inshallah. And for that, you have to, inshallah, just um, not talk as much, not include as much information, and also not be so quick in what you are saying and something else if you're a teacher now everybody is almost a teacher with your children with your friends with your spouse everybody is almost a teacher something else he used to do sallallahu alayhi wa sallam kana yu'idu al-kalimata thalathan li tu'qala an he used to repeat a sentence or a word three times so that it would be understood he used to repeat it three times so that it would be understood it doesn't mean, of course, that whatever he said, he would say it three times. It's not everything that he said he'd repeat three times. But what would he say three times? Important things. Something that is important. Or he feels that the listener may miss it. Or for emphasis. 
So he would say it three times. And if you say it three times, you are sure that everybody here, everybody around you got it. Because in the company, as you know, in the company, in the setting where the Prophet ﷺ is, and as a teacher you have to keep that in mind, you'd have the one who's intelligent and the one who's not. The one who can understand it from the first time, and the one who needs a second and a third time for him to understand it. So you're not only speaking to the highest or the most intelligent, you're speaking to everybody. And to make sure that everybody got it, you take your time explaining it, and you repeat when you need to repeat. And that's why he وسلم, was the best teacher, because he understood the needs of the people around him. So again, if you're a teacher, inshallah, or with your children, sometimes you need repetition. Don't get bored with it. You need repetition, and you need to be quiet, you need to be slow sometimes, you need to make sure that they understood what you are saying. Now, now we come to an interesting chapter, inshallah. And that chapter is about the smiling of the Prophet, his smile. Or has it, how he used to joke, that is also included in it. So let's, let's see the smile of the Prophet. So the Sahabi is saying, I didn't see anyone who would smile more than the Prophet ﷺ. I didn't see anyone who would smile more than the Prophet ﷺ. Although, think about it, he was carrying the burden of the entire ummah on his shoulder. And he had the same burdens, not even the same, more burden than any, of, any one of us. And yet, subhanAllah, what happens is that because of this burden sometimes, we stop smiling. We don't, we don't smile. We don't smile inside the home. We don't smile outside the home. We're grumpy and we're sad. But the Prophet ﷺ, with all the pressure, nobody would smile more than him. ﷺ. And that tells you something about the state of his heart and the state of his mind. And how much tawakkul he had upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And how positive he was. And how able he was to take all of that burden and give it to Allah Azza wa And believe that Allah will save him. And Allah will guide him. And Allah will champion him. And how, how much iman he has. And if you know that everything happens by the will of Allah, and if you're not going to get it, it's also by the will of Allah, it'd be easy to smile. And if you know that your smile will open the heart of another person, and it will be recorded as a good deed, it'll be easy for you to smile. So why was, was, was it easy for him to smile? Because he was a slave of Allah. Azza by the way, you know, what happened later... You know, uh, later generations, after the third generation and what have you, is that there were some worshippers of Allah who thought to themselves that if they are to be really pious and have real taqwa, they can never smile. But if you smile, it seems like you are attracted to the dunya. So the same people thought to themselves that if I'm really pious, I can never drink fresh water. I have to drink salty water. Because if I drink fresh water, that means that I, will, I like the dunya too much and I'm attracted to it so much, better I drink something that will make me hate the dunya. But is that the sunnah? So you take to them the hadith, and that's one of the benefits of the hadith. You say to yourself, okay, one hadith after the other, what am I learning from it? One benefit of the hadith, if you keep it in mind, if somebody comes and tells you, don't drink, good, uh, don't drink um, fresh water. And if it's sweet, that's even you know, more sinful. And don't eat meat. And don't... And you tell him, but the Prophet ﷺ reached the height of taqwa. Huh? And he loved meat. And he ﷺ loved fresh water and loved sweetened water. And that does not contradict taqwa, does it? No. So, it would not contradict my taqwa if I like these things. If I'm attracted to these things. So, and it does not contradict your taqwa to smile. It doesn't make you more pious and more focused on the hereafter if you're always crying or you're always sad. That is something that you keep to yourself in your salah. But once you're done with your salah and you go out and you're talking to people, they need your smile. Huh? So the Prophet would smile the most, more than anyone else, sallallahu alayhi wa And in another narration it says, مَا كَانَ ضَحِكُ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ إِلَّا تَبَسُّمَا He says the laughter of the Prophet sallallahu was only smiling. So if he would laugh, it doesn't reach that our laughter with voice, audible voice, loud. 
The Prophet ﷺ would only and mostly smile, sallallahu alaihi There is dignity in it. We'll see, inshallah, more of it. So the Prophet ﷺ, this is an instant where the Prophet smiled. Why did he smile? He said, "Inni la alamu awwal rajulin yadkhul al-jannah wa akhir rajulin yakhruj min al-nar." He says, "I know the first person who will enter jannah, and the first per- and the last person who will exit hellfire." The first person who will enter Jannah, and the last person who will leave Hellfire. I know those two. Then he says, Rajuli. So he's not talking here about the person who's going to leave Hellfire or enter Jannah first. He's talking about a different guy. So when he says, I know the first person who will enter Jannah. Who is that person? The, the Prophet That's the Prophet So he says, I know the first person who will enter it. And I know the last person who will exit Hellfire. And he'll leave behind the kuffar, the non-believer. He'll tell us about him, but not in this hadith, a hadith that will follow. But here he's telling us about somebody who's in the middle. Not the first and not the last, someone who's in the middle. So he says, a man will be brought on the day of judgment. And it will be said, meaning Allah will say, Present to him his minor sins. And then the major sins will be concealed. So present to him what? Minor sins, smaller ones. And conceal what? The big sins. He says, on that day, you did this and that. And he agrees, he's not denying any of it. And he's worried about what? The big ones. Because they're presenting to him the small ones. On that day, remember you did this? Yes. And on that day, do you remember you did that? Yes. He's not denying. And on that day, remember you did this? Yes. And as he's going through it, he's saying, I'm, okay, I'm, I, it's all these are small, 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 and the big ones are going to come. Huh? So his, his anxiety is, is increasing, subhanAllah. He says, give him instead of every bad deed, a good deed. So he says what? Oh ya Allah, I have sins I don't see here. Right? So the Prophet sallallahu he smiled until they could see his canine teeth. So when the Prophet, when he really is pleased and he smiles, you could see his teeth. Otherwise, he would just smile. But so if you could see his teeth, meaning he's happy. So the man, subhanAllah, why is the Prophet sallallahu happy and why did he smile? One, from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of how merciful Allah is. That this person has done and committed bad things, small bad things here. And what does Allah do? I say, take all of these bad things and give them instead of them good deeds. So the man is happy, and there's the rahmah of Allah, and the Prophet ﷺ is happy for him. And also the Prophet ﷺ is happy because of how his reaction or has his state has shifted. One, he was scared to see the big sins, and now he wants to see them. He said, I wish that they would vanish and go away. Because these are big sins. I don't want to see them. I hope that they stay hidden. But now that he saw that Allah Azza wa is giving him instead of every bad deed, a good deed, he says, bring out all everything. Let's discuss and talk about everything. Bring it out. So that is what made the Prophet wasallam smile. The rahmah of Allah Azza wa Jal and the rahmah specifically to this person and how every sin is uh, being replaced by a good deed. So this is a smile related to the uh, hereafter. One thing that will show you also the character of the Prophet ﷺ, and by the way, how that impacts a person, whether you know it or not. Jarir ibn Abdullah, he says, مَا حَجَبَنِي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ مُنْذُ أَسْلَمْ وَلَا رَآنِي إِلَّا ضَحِكْ He says, the Prophet ﷺ never denied me entry to meet him from the day that I accepted Islam, and whenever he saw me, he smiled. See how that impacted him. So you may not know. You may not know if you continuously smile in someone's face how he and she may be receiving this. But Allah knows and that person is going to be changed because of it. So Jarir is saying that whenever he sees me, he smiles in my face. Imagine the impact that that has on him. On his iman, on his taqwa. And how he, radiallahu anhu, will continue to smile because he remembers what? Whenever he saw me, he smiled. I'll continue to smile in everybody's face. So if you smile in someone's face, they may take that from you. 
They may adopt that from you. And all their smiles become good deeds that you inherit. See how easy that is? Good deeds that you inherit. And he says, he never denied me entry. If I wanted to meet him at any time, he would let me in. So he was a favorite of the Prophet Muhammad wasallam. He would honor him. And that definitely affects you. Now, so this is the last person who will leave hellfire. It's coming here. So he says, I know the last person who will leave hellfire. So what's his story? What's going to happen to him? A man who will come out of it crawling. Okay? Hardly, I mean again, he's been wrecked, he's tired, coming out of it, barely coming out of it, crawling. It will be said to him, Allah is telling him, go and enter Jannah. So he goes to enter Jannah and he'll find that everybody has taken their place in it. Everybody's in their home. So he thinks that it's what? Full. Full. There's no space in it for me. Okay? There's no space in it. Everybody is in their own home. Where am I going to go in, inside? Everybody has taken their own residence and place in Jannah. So what does Allah tell him? This is nice. Yeah, I want you to savor it, inshallah. So do you remember the time that you used to be in? Back, 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 back then, right? Now, yeah, in the, on this earth. Remember that, back, back time? He says, yes. He says, then wish. And he think about those wishes then, right? Wish. So he wishes. Meaning like everything, like somebody, if he tells you now, wish. Go, wish. What do you wish for? In your mind, what do you wish for? Wish for something. Wish for, wish for a lot. Huh? One, house one, one house and one car and this and that. A wish, wish. Like, you remember your, all your wishes when you were living on this earth? Everything that you wished for? He says, yeah. He's, your memory is still there. He says, a wish for it. So he wishes, 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 wishes. So he says, لَكَ الَّذِي تَمَنَّيْ وَعَشْرَةُ أَضْعَافِ الدُّنْيَا He says, you have everything that you've wished for and ten times this world. Ten times this world. So he says, are you mocking me and you're the king? He said, yeah. He doesn't believe it. Are you going to give me this? You're mocking me, you're making fun of me, and you're the king. Why would you make fun of me? I'm like nobody. Why would you make fun of me? So the Prophet ﷺ smiled until you could see his teeth. So the, the maximum that you could wish for on this earth, as, as the brother said, nobody wishes and no one can get because you can never get it this whole dunya. You can never get it. You can wish for it, but you never get it. So our wishes are always beneath that. Give me a million, two million, for, but not every uh, you know, gold and silver on the face of this earth. You will never get that. So these are our wishes. So he says, wish, wish, wish. So wishes for everything. And then says, if I have this entire world, uh, world, this entire dunya multiplied by 10. And that is what? Who gets this? The lowest. The lowest. We kill ourselves, we sell our mothers and fathers, not for this dunya, not for half of it, not one a quarter of it, for a little bit of it. Okay? We deny everything that we know. We deny Allah Azza wa Jal for it. And Allah Azza wa Jal is saying, if you just enter Jannah, the minimum that I will give you is like this dunya multiplied by 10, plus everything else you wish for. So subhanAllah, you know, this dunya is nothing for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal. And you imagine how much space is left in Jannah. So that guy couldn't see. How much space is left in Jannah and how much can it accommodate that the least person gets 10 times the dunya? 10 times the dunya for the lowest? Okay, what about the highest? Or at least not, not Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but at least in that, that category, the highest category. What do they get? So subhanAllah, if there is motivation to obey Allah Azza wa this is it. If there is a reason to love Allah Azza wa Jal, this is it. If there is reason to look with disdain, you know, and with insignificance at the dunya, this is it. Because it's nothing. And if you just obey Allah Azza wa Jal, Allah will give you so much that is even beyond what you can wish for. Beyond what you can imagine. SubhanAllah. Now, So, the following one is also... Um, an instance where the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam also smiled. He says, Ali ibn Rabi'ah, he says, I witnessed Ali ibn Abi Talib radiyallahu anhu, and he was brought a, an animal to ride on. فلما, when he put his 
foot or uh, his foot في الركاب on the stirrup and this is like a ring that is attached attached to the saddle you put your foot on so that you would climb on the saddle and sit on the animal so when he put his foot there he said bismillah and when he settled on top of that animal he said alhamdulillah then he said subhanalladhi sakhkhara lana hadha wa ma kunna lahu muqrinin wa inna ila rabbina lamunqalibun praise be to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who had given us power over there over it وَمَا كُنَّا لَهُ مُقْرِنِينَ And we have no power, no innate power over it. And indeed, we will go back to Allah Azza wa Jal. Then he said, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. Then he said, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. So Alhamdulillah three times, Allahu Akbar three times. سُبْحَانَكَ إِنِّي ظَلَمْتُ نَفْسِي فَاغْفِرْ لِي فَإِنَّهُ لَا يَغْفِرُ الذُّنُوبَ إِلَّا أَنْ Praise be to you, glorified may you be. Uh, indeed, I have wronged myself, so forgive me, because indeed no one forgives sins except you. And then he smiled. Ali, radiyallahu anhu, then he smiled. So they said, why are you smiling? You know, commander of the faithful, prince of the believers. So he was the khalifa at that moment. He said, I saw the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam do exactly as I did. Then he smiled. And then I said, why are you smiling, O messenger of Allah? He says, indeed, Allah la ya'jabu. مِنْ عَبْدِهِ إِنَّ رَبَّكَ لَيَعْجَبُ مِنْ عَبْدِهِ He marvels and wonders at his slave. When he says, forgive me my sins, he knows that no one forgives sins except Allah. Why is the Prophet ﷺ smiling out of happiness? Because Allah is happy with that. He marvels at him. He says, look at my slave. He's asking me for forgiveness, knowing that no one can forgive except me. So Allah is, is a wonder, and this wonder is a wonder or an amazement from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not like our amazement. When we are amazed, we're amazed because we don't expect what's going to happen. Allah knows what's going to happen. But He is amazed at it because He likes it. He loves it so much, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is amazed by it. And He loves that man and loves what He has done. And for that, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam smiled. Huh? Smiled because of the rahmah. And the forgiveness of Allah Azza wa that this man is receiving when he says this dua. And this is, by the way, is the dua when you ride your car. This is what you do when you ride your car, inshallah. That's the dua. And that part where you're asking forgiveness from Allah Azza wa because this is a ni'mah from Allah. And actually using it fully is always conditional upon the, the blessings of Allah Azza wa and us being free from sin. So, continuously asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness allows you to enjoy the ni'mas of Allah azza wa jal and for you to get more and more of them bi idnillah azza wa jal. Now, this chapter is about how the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to joke. Some of his uh, jokes sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he used to joke. But here, when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to joke, as we will see insha'Allah, there are conditions for it. One, that if you're going to joke and kid with people, first of all, you would always have to say the truth and never lie. The truth and never lie. You cannot lie in any way in order to make another person laugh. And the Prophet says, وَيْلٌ لَهُ وَيْلٌ لَهُ وَيْلٌ لَهُ الَّذِي يَكْذِبُ لِيُضْحِكَ النَّاسِ The one who lies to make people laugh, وَيْلٌ لَهُ وَوْ to him, وَوْ to him, وَوْ to him. Because it's a lie. It's a lie. Second of all, don't mock and ridicule other people. If you're going to make others laugh, not at the expense of someone else or some other people. So don't mock other people or don't mock another human being. You don't mock them. And don't, also don't be excessive. Don't do it too often. Because if you do it too often, even if you're trying to be careful, you're going to end up hurting someone. Because you can't control yourself. It's just one joke after the other. You're going to end up hurting someone. Um, and also, it's going to take away your dignity. It's going to rob you of dignity. And also hardens the heart. So they say, use it like salt with food. Too much of it ruins the meat. Right? Just put a little bit of it. Right? Just put a little bit of it. And, and don't try, inshallah, to force it. Whatever is natural. As long as you follow these guidelines, inshallah, you're fine. So here is uh, some examples. He says, the Prophet ﷺ said to Anas ibn Malik, Ya dal udunayn, O one of two ears, O you with two ears. Right? So he called him like that, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
So, yeah, it's like calling him, let's say, hey, two ears, come here. Hey, two ears, come here. And it's not that his ears were big, but the Prophet ﷺ just called him that. Okay, isn't it true that everybody has two ears? But there's nothing special, right, about that. But this is how he kid, sallallahu alayhi wa hey, two ears, come. It's true. It's absolutely true. Right? So, and it, it, he did not offend by saying that. Now, if you're going to say like, something like that, and you're going to offend someone, don't. But he did not offend, sallallahu alayhi wa when he said that. And it brings you closer to the other person. Another one, and this is how the Prophet used to interact. And Nafsul Rumanik said, إِنْ كَانَ الرَّسُولُ لَيُخَالِطُنَا حَتَّى يَقُولَ لِأَخِنْ لِيَا صَغِيرِ يَا أَبَا عُمَيْرِ مَا فَعَلَ النُّغَيْنِ He said the Prophet ﷺ would mix with us and socialize to the extent that he would say to a young brother of mine, O oh Abu Umair, what did the small bird do? Or what happened to the small bird? So, subhanAllah, there are some, and especially, especially this hadith, they say some of the scholars have actually just from this hadith had extracted 60 benefits. Just from what I just read. Ya Abu Umair, O oh Abu Umair, what did the small bird do? He says, just from these words, they're able to extract 60 benefits. I'll mention, inshallah, some of them. But the beginning of it, when he says, in kana la yukhalituna, he would socialize and mix with us. That the Prophet ﷺ was not aloof, was not isolated. And by the way, that's not something easy. To have all that knowledge and though all that, was, all that type of responsibility, and yet you're able to mix with everybody freely. And your life is an open book. And not only mix with adults, but mix with children and talk to children because this is a child. So the Prophet ﷺ was very accessible, even by children. They can come and talk to him, and he would go and talk to them. So what did he say to him? A young child. And he says, Oh Abu Umair. So the Prophet gave him a kunya. Right? Typically at that age, you don't get a kunya. Maybe you can, but he gave him a kunya. Oh Abu Umair. So that's, that's a sign of respect. It's also endearment. Oh Abu Umair, what happened to the bird that you have? The bird that he had passed away, died. So he was sad because of it. So the Prophet wanted to come and console him and make him feel better. So he said, what happened to your bird? And by the way, that child also died young. Also died young. So here you find how gentle and merciful the Prophet ﷺ, that he would take time, especially if you think that you're the leader, the shaykh, the imam, and whatever, you don't have time for children and talking to them, but he would take time to spend with them وسلم, and console them and you know, make them feel better. And one of the benefits he says in um, Tirmidhi is saying, is that you're allowed to kid with the children or joke with them or uh, talk to them about matters that concern them, and he gave them a kunya, and it's allowed for a person to play with a bird as long as they don't harm it. Um, and these are some of the benefits in it, in addition to that, what I said also. They asked the Prophet wasallam. that's the following hadith. They say, O oh, Prophet of Allah, you joke with us. إِنَّكَ تُدَعِبُنَا, you joke with us. He says, نَعَمْ غَيْرَ أَنِّي لَا أَقُولُ إِلَّا حَقَّ He says, yes, except I only speak the truth. He never lies. So you kid, you joke with us, he says yes. But of course not often. It's not all the time. And some of us, subhanAllah, are comedians. Whenever you sit, it's just a joke after a joke. And you think you adopt this position of a comedian, I must make people laugh. That's not it. But if it's natural, if it comes once in a while, that's fine, inshallah. Like as, as we said, كَثْرَةُ الضَّحِكِ تُمِيتُ الْقَلْبِ Excessive laughter does that what to the heart? Excessive laughter kills the heart. تُمِيتُ الْقَلْبِ So not too much of it. So, one example of saying the truth while also kidding with someone. Someone came and he was asking the Prophet ﷺ to grant him a ride, a camel to ride on and carry his things on. So he said, I will give you the child of a camel. He said, the Prophet of Allah, the child of a camel, what is that going to help? He said, isn't every camel the child of a camel? Follow what I'm saying? So what did he think when he said, I'll give you the child? of a camel, like a young camel like that. So am I supposed to carry him or he's going to carry me? Who's going to carry the other? He can't, ca he can't carry anything. He was saying, what do we do with a small camel? But the Prophet did not mean a small camel. He just said the child, the child, the son of a camel. 
It says, no, every adult camel came from a camel. That's what I mean by it. Right? So this is how he jokes, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Did he, did he speak the truth? He spoke the truth. But, you know, it's just how does this person understand? This is how he joked with a, uh, another uh, man. His name is Zahir. So it says here that a nomad, a Bedouin, his name is Zahir. Whenever he would come from the desert to the Medina, he'd always bring a, a gift to the Prophet ﷺ. And when he would, about to, would, be, would be about to leave, the Prophet would supply him and provide him with stuff from Medina. So if he's coming in, he's bringing a gift to the Prophet. He is leaving, the Prophet gives him some things that he can take with him back to his home, back to the desert. And he used to say, إِنَّ زَاهِرًا بَادِيَتُنَا وَنَحْنُ حَاضِرُونَ Zahir is our desert and we are his city. So if we need anything from the desert, Zahir brings it to us. And if he needs anything from the city, we give it to him. Okay? So this is the interconnection. <laughs> so, and the Prophet loved him. وَكَانَ رَجُلًا دَمِيمًا And he was an ugly man. Right? So the Prophet loved him. And he was an ugly man. So, فَأَتَاهُ النَّبِيُّ يَوْمَنُ هُوَ يَبِيعُ مَتَاعَهُ So the Prophet ﷺ came, and Zahir was in the market, and he was selling his stuff. And he doesn't know that the Prophet ﷺ has come. So, now, so the Prophet hugged him from behind, hugged him from behind, and he cannot, doesn't see who that is. So he said, who is this? Let go of me. All right, who is this? Let go of me. So when he knew that it was the Prophet, when he looked back and he knew that it was Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he was trying to let go, right? Then he would push himself back so that he would be closer to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, making that he's sure that his back touches the chest of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So the Prophet said, "Man yashtari hadha al-abd? Who would buy this slave right, in the market? It is the market, right? So he's holding him still. So who's going to buy this slave?" So he said, Ya Rasulullah, إِذَنْ وَاللَّهِ تَجِدُ تَجِدُنِي كَاسِدًا He says, Ya Allah, O Prophet of Allah, I'll be unsaleable. No one is going to buy me. Right? No one is going to buy me. فَقَالَ النَّبِيُّ لَكِنَ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ لَسْتَ بِكَاسِدًا But for Allah Azza wa Jal, you're not unsaleable. Or with Allah Azza wa Jal, you are precious. You're valuable. So subhanAllah. So he was a Bedouin, he was ugly, but that does not matter. That does not matter. The Prophet ﷺ, loved him, and it's enough of a testimony that the Prophet ﷺ says that you are in the sight of Allah Azza wa Jal, very valuable. SubhanAllah. So again, see how, how, how good that must have made him feel. And just the fact that the Prophet ﷺ loved him, and he's the leader of his people, and he does not find that as you know, a deterrent from him going and hugging him like that, and being natural. In Medina, in the market, in front of everybody, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, does not take away from his dignity. Because I know for some of us, subhanAllah, you know, we are raised in a way to think that if you joke a little bit, it takes away from your dignity. Just like the Arab thought. If I kiss my child, that takes away from my dignity and the respect in my people. I'm never going to hug my child, kiss my child. They used to think like that. So some of us still think like that. If I joke a little bit, oh, you know, that, that's just undignified. No. The Prophet ﷺ did. It doesn't mean that you have to force it. It doesn't have to keep go and learn jokes online and come and share them with us. It doesn't mean that. But in a sense, if it's natural, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. If it's not, don't worry about it. Now, this following hadith, inshaAllah, I'll read it. Um, now, its chain is between being authentic and weak. It's between being authentic or weak. So, Shaykh Al Albani, although this chain right here is weak, but Shaykh al-Albani says there are other um, narrations that support it. Uh, some others say that it's weak, but anyway, inshallah, I'll read it in case it is, um, it's authentic, but if, um, but it's possible to keep, up, keep, yeah, to keep in mind the possibility that it may be weak as well. So, uh, an old woman came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and she said, O Prophet of Allah, make dua for me that I will enter Jannah. So the Prophet says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, O mother of so and so, no old woman will enter Jannah. No old woman will enter Jannah. So she started crying. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Tell her that she will not enter it when she is old. Because Allah Azza wa Jal says, Inna ansha'anahunna insha'a, fajalnahunna abkaran uruban atraba. Indeed, we're going to recreate them 
and you will enter it as young, young men and young women. So what he said, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, is true. No old woman is going to enter Jannah. I mean, what did she think? I can't. You know, I, I've I passed, I passed, you know, the age limit where I'd be able to enter Jannah. But she didn't understand why would there be an age limit? Like everybody then would commit suicide, then right? Would kill themselves somehow because I will not want to be old. If, because if I'm old, I'll not enter Jannah. So she didn't catch it. She didn't catch that, and she started crying. So the Prophet said, "No, no, tell her." That, no, she will never enter Jannah when she's old, right? She'll enter Jannah when she's young. So that's also speaking the truth. But the listener doesn't really understand what you're saying. And that's how the Prophet ﷺ uh, joked. And this is the ma'arid, by the way. Ambiguous speech that is understood in one way, but you mean it in another. Inshallah. Tayyip. Um, let's stop here. Huh? One more? No, I mean, because there's a competition, right? We need to give you the questions. Yeah? Okay, inshallah. Are you ready? You have your... Uh, okay, inshallah. So, so like, like we did last time, inshallah, it's the same format. So we'll ask one question for those who are 17 and below, if you are here. So brothers and sisters, 17 and below, that is the first question. You have to write it down and write your name. Right? Um... And then we'll ask a question for 18 and above for both sisters and brothers. So you must have a piece of paper, write the answer and write your name on it. And inshallah, we'll ask questions for uh, anyone who's following us online. And we'll give you inshallah um, the uh, criteria for the answer, inshallah. So I just want to make sure and you're ready. I'll give you just a minute inshallah to get ready. And if you're, if you're going to inshallah be answering online, make sure that you answer in the comment section. Don't send me a message, answer in the comment section. And you can answer directly, you don't need to repeat the question. You can just put the answer directly, inshallah. So the person who answers that first is going to get it, inshallah. First accurate answer, inshallah. So let me know if you are ready. And I'll repeat the question, inshallah, a couple of times, inshallah. So the first question, and I'll read it a couple of times. So for 17 and under, for the brothers and for the sister. Pick one from the brothers and one from the sisters. So the first question is, the Prophet wasallam loved meat. Which part of the lamb did he love the most? It's an easy one. That's such an easy one. Okay? Okay? So I'll repeat that again. And again, it's, it's, it's not a group activity. Huh? It's not a group activity. No one else can help you. On only be you. Your own answer. So again, the uh, question is, the Prophet wasallam, as we learned, he loved me. Which part of the lamb did he love the most? Which part of the lamb did he love the most? Okay. Should I repeat it one more time? I can come back to it, inshallah. Let me say the, que the second question, and then I can come back and repeat all the questions again. So this is the, so the question for the um, brothers and sisters 18 and above. Brothers and sisters in the masjid 18 and above. So the Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith that the virtue of Aisha is like the virtue of one particular food over all other food. So he says that fadlu Aisha... The virtue of Aisha compared to the rest of women is like the virtue of one particular food compared to all other food. What is this food that he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam named that he compared to Aisha? What is this food that he compared Aisha to? You can give the name or you can describe it in English. What is this food? And I want you to add what is special about it. So what is this food that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam compared Aisha to? And what is special about it? Okay. Is that difficult? No, right? Well, that's not yours. <laughs> that's not your question. That's not your question. So it's, it's supposed to be more difficult than the first. But is it too difficult? No? It's okay, inshallah? Yeah. Okay. So I'll, I'll say it again. So... 
the Prophet ﷺ compared Aisha to one food that he said is has more quality or uh, more favor or more in it, better than all other food. So what is this food that the Prophet ﷺ compared Aisha to and what is special about it? And then um, for the online viewers, um, if you forget to say, and this is easy also, if you forget to say Bismillah at the beginning of a meal, what should you do or say? And this you can inshallah write it in Arabic or in English. So that's easy to inshallah. So if you forget to say Bismillah in the beginning, what are you supposed to do or say? Remember in the middle. So what are you supposed to do or say? You can say that in Arabic if you remember it, or if not, English is also acceptable. Should I repeat the first question, or you're okay with the first one? You're okay? Good? So, just in case, the first question is that the Prophet ﷺ loved meat, which part of the land did he love most? Let me see now if you have any questions, inshallah, about anything that he said, or anything you would like to add. Questions? No? Everybody's busy writing? No? So next week, inshallah, we're going to keep it after Maghrib. Right? Inshallah. And then the week after, bi'ithnillah, we are going to move it. When the time changes, we will move it to after Isha, inshallah. So we should conclude? Insha'Allah. Jazakumullah khairah for listening. See you next week. Bi'ithnillah after Maghrib. Subhanakallah wa bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Alhamdulillah.